I've been asking on my YouTube channel and other places to find dissident artists, right? Like we're doing this whole, there's this whole cultural struggle going on right now. And the left has captured all of the institutions, all of the art, all of the media, all of the universities, everything. They make every movie. They seem to make and populate all of the art museums, all of the galleries. And I've been putting out a call for dissident art. I've heard some good dissident music. I've heard, uh, you know, um, I am Tom McDonald on Twitter. Tom McDonald's been killing it for me on my Spotify list. I'm spacing on a few other names right now. Chandler Crump, guy out of Florida, 17 years old, putting out hip hop, speaking his mind, being a dissident. And, uh, you know, now I want to talk to you about visual arts and the way that visual arts work in this whole milieu that we're operating in. Uh, and you've got quite a story, actually. And I want to just really start from the beginning, man, because I, I want people to appreciate and understand who you are, your art, and that we're not just talking to somebody who's like throwing shit up on the wall. Uh, so let's start from the beginning, man. Tell me and introduce yourself to me and to the audience. And how, how did you get involved in art? What is your training like in art? And let's just go from there. And I got a whole list of things. I got a pieces of yours I want to talk about. I've got them all loaded up so we can take a look at them. But let's go, Arthur. Like, how'd you get involved in art? What kind of artist yeah. are you? What kind of training have you had? Let's get, let's set the stage. Sure. So in my background, just to give a little bit of context in regards to the imprinting and how I have this vantage point, you know, my mother, she's a classical composer and has her dissertation in music theory. And she's a composer at like the university level. So I was always acclimated with the classics and being surrounded by literature and all this sort of romanticism. My father, is, he's a minister. So I often tell people I'm like this visual fusion of them where I'm excavating symbolic ideas and going down this rabbit hole visually. And that's sort of how my voice came to be. But I wanted to originally go into art school to study art history. That was the, the context originally. And... But eventually what I came to see is that I was winning all the painting awards and I was winning all the painting awards because <laughs> the students who are studying art, they're, they're ultimately learning this vogue politics. And when you study art history, you're forced to recognize, you know, pedagogical standards, which implies tradition to it. And when you're painting with that context, you make work that is fortifying cultural value. So I was, I ended up, going um dedicating my brush towards the logos essentially and this has been pretty much what has caused me to become a controversial figure in the new york city art scene which surprised me let's stop there for a second uh you studied art history did you actually like go uh for fine arts too like like get a classical education yeah. and like paint all the techniques and everything okay color everything so what do you mean when you say that you are expressing logos through your brush? Well, if you look at like the greatest masterpieces in all of history, they're always undergirded by masculinity and spiritual excavation. And this is a pattern that I've noticed. And with that said, you know, it all, it all, it's all connected. Like I always wondered why I became more conservative and my reasons are not because of superior policy implementation or views on welfare or abortion or any of that. It's, I'm a conservative for purely aesthetic reasons. And this is something that I feel like is important for people on our side of the aisle to recognize that we need to be able to justify our position for aesthetic and, and cultural reasons just as much as all these political, you know, banter essentially for me. And, and that was my attraction to it, that e even when I was an atheist, I noticed that the imagery that I was most attracted to was during the Christian art period. And I think it's because there's something there that you can't deny. And if you're going to be honest with it, today's art, most of it in the gallery scene at least, and, I'm, and I've been in a gallery circuit in New York City for 10 years, most of it is garbage. You know, it's, it's, it's trash. Whenever you go into a gallery, Jack, you see all this vague miasmic work and you think, why are they valuing it at this cost? Right. <laughs> I'm sure you felt that. <laughs> and yeah, they, they've lost the objective standards. Interesting. Interesting. So, uh, man, we're already off script. What do you mean you were an atheist? What is that? What is that story about? Oh, well, well it's connected for me because 
I think being a visual artist is a very spiritual route. And, you know, when you study our history, you can't help but see that the most symbolically powerful work was produced from spiritual artists. You know, look at the Pieta. You know, look at, um, when, like, even, even, like, the Pieta is a very symbolically reverent work. And what it's capturing is this implication of a transcendent morality. And that's what attracted me to all this artistry. And I think it's connected to all the cultural decadence today that we've lost that. And the artists are, presu- you know, they're no longer preserving it. They're spreading vanity. And I think the role of the artist, this, you know, this being my medium, is to be somebody who preserves truth. That, that's sort of the uh, language that I'm, you know, diving into. Preserving truth. Okay, I have a million questions already, but we didn't get to finish setting the table just yet. Preserve, preserving truth through art. Man, you know, if you walk into a gallery today, it seems to me that they're trying to challenge art, challenge truth, challenge reality, challenge uh, classical thinking, um, structure, color, line, form, all these things. That it seems to me they're trying to just throw those out the window and flush them down the toilet, uh, and certainly not preserving truth although i guess one may argue that um some of the art that i've seen at like the hirshhorn here in washington dc modern art museum uh that they think that they're preserving some element of truth but to me most of it it strikes me as pop pop protest graphic rather than like uh actual art that's preserving truth as you say it but before we get into that before we uh, get into i want to talk more about i was an atheist that statement has (laughs) there's a lot in that statement uh i just want to finish the story about your training and your circumstances in new york city right so like you went to school for art history you switched it up you became a visual artist you studied this then you you start making art and you're instantly successful like what what happens because that's that's Probably not the story. <laughs> yeah, so I, I ended up getting, you know, usually around art school, right when you graduate, uh, if you're going to be an artist, not a graphic designer, any of these other mediums, you want to get into shows. And typically people are applying for group shows and getting rejected pretty often because that's the hustle you have to go into. And, I, and my phase of that was very short. I got solo shows pretty quickly and I had collectors pretty quickly as well. But the more... I moved up with this momentum, the more you get acclimated with radical people. And I quickly saw that the art industry is pretty much owned by like anti-American elite people. And, but I was very quiet. I did this sort of social camouflage thing where I knew what I believed, but you know, these sophists are paying my bills, right? So (laughs) I I was in this place where I basically was, um, blending in and just the height of what I was excavating in my art and how and a lot of attention associated with it. They gave me artist of the year in 2016 and 2020 from different organizations. And that, that, that implied a lot, but you know, I started to get connected with bigger collectors and influential players in New York city. And eventually you can't help but be sort of vetted to see if you're going to compromise yourself and live under the shadow for these quick cut bucks. And this is something that so many artists have dealt with and a lot of people have become physically compromised or, but definitely ideologically so, where my values didn't line up. And I got to a point where I just sort of let go and decided to go completely independent. And yeah, they, they pretty much ousted me. So 2016, 2020, you're winning awards, artists of the year from various publications and, and authorities in New York City. You're uh, a, 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 an early success. I mean, first off, most people that do visual arts never make any money or have any success whatsoever. A very few of them make it into group shows and even fewer of them make it into solo shows and even fewer of them end up having established uh, patrons and collectors uh, looking to support your work. So that in and of itself is an amazing accomplishment. Congratulations. What do you mean? And now I I can see how, especially in New York City, the money, the elites, the globalists, 
they they have the money and they have the control and they're interested in art, so they're buying art. And the people that buy the art tend to also have influence on the art through their purchases and incentivizing pieces and and uh, commissioning pieces even, and just through the marketplace of rewarding people that produce art that they like so that they can keep, keep producing more, right? So I can see how you would get sucked up further into the elite world of New York City, Manhattan, and, and essentially the world in that respect. What do you mean by eventually you become vetted? What did what did you mean by that? I'm I'm not going to name anyone specifically, but definitely. So the art world's very small, and as you move up there, they're not going to just give anyone a position to, you know, launder launder their art for money, anything of that sort. They're going to make sure that you can be controlled. Um, I can tell you off camera name specifically, um. <laughs> but, but, uh, I've been to party with known Democrats and I, I mean, it, it, I've, I've been to these circles, man. And I don't think it was hypocrisy. It was ignorant because I didn't necessarily know any of these names, but in retrospect, some of these things started to connect. And, um, if you want to make that. There's a certain, there's different levels to the art gallery scene and the higher you go up, the smaller the circle gets. If you get into that sphere, yeah, they're, they're going to make sure you're somebody who will keep their mouth shut. That's all I'll say. Mm. And were you, were you specifically approached by people looking to launder money through art? It's never that direct. <laughs> it's always like a, it's always a nice sushi dinner, a lot of drinking and it's always, multiple times hanging out it's never it's never approached with that you know hey can you do this for me it's never like that even right. when i got blacklisted by all these galleries it wasn't like you don't get a letter right <laughs> it's more like they they, they you know what i'll tell you, i was concerned with six different galleries last year for example on the early end before they all sort of shut me off and they all know each other we all hung out at the same area that same rooftop bar every tuesday night that whole little club right and they tell me, listen, um, uh, we'd like to talk to you. I'm like, okay, uh, is it because I went on the Jesse Lee Peterson show, for example? And then, because he asked me to come on to ask me about Stop Asian Hate and all this stuff. And I think that's all bullshit. And I'm like, is it about that? You know, is it about more wokeism? Because I've already lost two galleries who wanted to work with me. They said, no, 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 we just want to talk to you. And I'm like, okay, how about you meet me at my studio Thursday evening? He said, no problem. I'm here at, the ga I'm here at my studio. Evening comes around. Doorbell rings. I say, hey, we're here to drop off uh, a bunch of work. I'm like, oh, see, one plus one is two. So I've had those kind of situations where, you know, they, they it, it's like you don't agree with them ideologically, so they basically castigate you, and you're not, a, you know, you're not a part of their cool club anymore. Interesting. Interesting. And, yeah. uh, you're not going to say this, but I'll put it into context. There's a lot of discussion these days about the value of one Hunter Biden's art. Right. And so people are trying to understand how and why Hunter Biden can sell a piece of shit for $500,000. And that is just a glimpse into the universe, uh, where people produce art to sell for big money. And then the money flows to a different place besides the gallery. And that is a one way that you can move money around, quote unquote, legally. Uh, and it's it's no wonder uh, that Hunter art, Hunter Biden's art is under suspicion right now, uh, given his circumstance and his connections and what one could very reasonably deduce about the New York City art scene and its connection to global money and the globalist and the, the GAE, as Darren Beatty puts it. Um, that's very interesting. I won't press you too much further on that. Uh, well, but, well, I mean, Tom, Tom Wolf predicted this, you know, the American cultural critic, he wrote yeah. the painted world and he wrote that, you know, he said, just based on this constant need to often make this reframing of avant-garde art to be edgy, not based on classical standards. Um, he said that inevitably the radical left would take control of this higher world and, you know, money launder the criminal element. Um, I mean, he, he sort of predicted that this was going to happen. I don't think it would, he understood how far it would go. But he wrote this in the painted word. He said, this is a perfect space for the radical left to go into and, you know, capitalize essentially. So fascinating. 
So, you know, my, I studied art history in school too. I went, uh, I did a semester in England and, uh, it was for specifically for art history, traveled, uh, throughout Northern Europe, looking at, at museums on trips and art history as well. And, uh, I became very acquainted with like medieval art and folks like Hieronymus Bosch and others doing really wild, crazy stuff, but still contemporary, still reflecting some element of reality and such. Uh, and I love the art history in this, in learning the history, right? <laughs> like the context and who it was and why, and why did they make this piece and who sponsored it and what impact did it have and where did it hang and what was the influence on history and what was it trying to preserve you know, where we are today? There's nothing like that, right? At least nothing that I have seen. Uh, and it's just interesting to me to see the, and hear from you, the continued devolution. Mm -hmm.